Job the 13th chapter, please. Now, um, <laughs> those who get discouraged probably speak best about discouragement. Um, we're the best at pronouncing and producing the pity party first. We're the ones that usually jump, you know, when it says, uh, <laughs> when the inner thing uh, says be discouraged in one way or another. And it begins to talk to us and it begins to plead to us and we might resist it just a little bit. We know we shouldn't be discouraged. We know we have the word of God on our side in regards to various situations. We know we've heard that scripture somewhere before. What is that scripture? Let's see. It has to do with, oh gosh, uh, uh, I'm not sure. It's like, oh, he sends his word and does something. And then and maybe I could use that, but I'm not sure. I should have listened a little bit better, I suppose, when Elder Brian in, uh, in the service was talking about that, but I missed out on that. Um, a lot of times discouragement takes place because we're just not ready to fight. Not ready to fight. And we come back to that idea that we've heard time and time again from Paul out of the sixth chapter of Ephesians about having done all to stand, what? Fall apart, get discouraged, keep on standing. Standing position that has been granted to you with that helmet of salvation, with that shield of faith, with that sharp sword of the spirit and that belt of truth that goes around us and those feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having done all to stand, now what? Continue to stand in that way with those things happening in your lives. Discouragement. Discouragement. So I've titled the teaching today, Dismantling Discouragement. You know, guys who work on uh, motors, small engines, big engines, know there's a lot of little parts inside of those engines. Same thing is true with computers, right? A lot of little tiny parts that have to be accounted for if this computer, in this case, is going to work correctly. And I think discouragement is very much like that. Discouragement is not about one big thing that discourages us. Discouragement is about a lot of little things that pile up that we're not taking care of as we move along through this walk. And we have the opportunity to either be discouraged or beat discouragement. We have the opportunity to do one another. And when we let that little thing go and we just sort of ignore it, you might get a little bit of relief a little bit later, but it's there. It's in the background and it begins to build up one thing added to another. It's the brick on top of the brick on top of the brick. The dismantling of discouragement is a brick at a time. And you have to learn, you have to learn how to take these things apart in accordance with the word. How do I beat back discouragement? Well, depending upon what it is that you're discouraged over. Maybe you're discouraged over finances. You know, we just got our, uh, uh, this week the, the elders have been getting our financial report uh, that's been happening here during this month. You know, and there's some information there in regards to uh, the giving that is not exactly encouraging. Now, we could let that grab hold of us. We could let that take hold of us. Uh, we could say, well, we could knee-jerk a reaction or something like that. Or we can believe what God's word has to say, which we, the elders have cho chosen to do. And we can believe that all things are possible for him that believes. We can believe that. We can choose to believe that. We can also believe that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. We can take the power and the muscle that comes from that, grip it, hold it close to us. Or, or we can begin to sort of wade around in the shallow end of the pool. And I'm in the pool, but I'm not really swimming, you know, kind of a routine. Well, we choose not to do that. We choose to believe what Christ said. Christ said, have the faith of God, Mark 11, 22. He said, speak unto that mountain and it will be removed. In Luke's the 17th chapter, the boys come to him and they say, increase our faith. He said, well, if you had faith, 
as small as the grain of a mustard seed, you say to the sycamore tree, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done unto you. You know, obviously he's not talking about actually removing a tree from the field. That's not what this is about. This is about much more important things. Now, what does that have to do with discouragement? Well, simply this, a person that is walking by faith, not by sight, walking by faith, not by sight, is a person who is less apt to be discouraged than the person who is constantly fleshing out. Not in the word, not attending church, not being where they're supposed to be. Hi, sis. You look good. Oh, uh, you do. You and I, we're all right. I don't feel real swinging right now myself, but it's all right. Because the word of the Lord is greater than how I feel. The Psalms, I forget which Psalm. We just read it yesterday and I forgot which number it was. I'm sorry. You can beat me up later, honey. The Psalm says that, that God lifts up his word above his name. Lifts up his word above his name. That's a lot to think about right there. That's the power and the premise of the word of God going forward. Let it, like David said, be hidden in my heart. Why? So I don't sin against you. If you know what the word says and you allow yourself to fall into discouragement, no matter what it is, it's sin. Because the Bible says, let the word of God dwell in you. Colossians 3.16. Let it dwell in you richly. What does richly mean? Man, that's like a checkbook with never ending, not never ending checks, but never ending bucks in the account that makes the checks good. Yes? So we're going to talk about dismantling discouragement through three sets of eyes, through three divine inspired opinions, three different men in the Bible. And this, of course, is not exhaustive. We could find others that are, that are here in the scripture. By the way, I am so glad to be with you today. I'm so glad to be in church. You know? Thanks, brother. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what. I, uh, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Okay, I'll get sidetracked and start talking about that. We're going to look at three different gentlemen. We're going to look at Job. How did Job dismantle discouragement? Then we're going to talk about dismantling discouragement with David, King David, and his situation. He had several situations. He had a lot to be discouraged over. But you will notice, we're just going to look at one passage. You will notice how that he turns and exercises his will to go God's way to come out of that which would have beat him down, thrown him under the bus, and rendered his kingdom, and really the type of the messianic a kingdom, ineffective. And then thirdly, we'll look at dismantling discouragement with the Apostle Paul. But right now, we want to head on over to Job and the 13th chapter. Now, I'm using... Uh, the King Jimmy government Bible here today uh, because I like the way it speaks uh, in a couple of these passages. But next week, we'll, I'll be back with the New American Standard of the Bible that Paul used. Okay, so Job 13. <coughs> and you know the story with Job. Oh, my gosh. He was like, he, he was the man of faith in that area in which he was living. And, of course, here comes that time, that strange story, that strange happening where all the sons of God, it's another name for angels, come before God the Father, the Ancient of Days, Christ Jesus the Son, and Satan comes along with him. And the challenge ensues right there. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him, you know. And he says, oh, man, you know, let's just deal with the things that Satan says. Let's deal with the things that are important to him. You start taking away his money. You start taking away his kids. You start taking away his livelihood. He'll change. He'll turn. He says, go ahead. God had to give him permission. And that's always how it is. Go ahead. And so... He loses all of his cattle. He loses his sons and his daughters. This is incredible. He loses all his livelihood. It was like the richest man in that part of the world. And we don't know when Job was written. But Job, what an example. And he says at the end of all of this, Job says, Well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, he didn't have a Bible like you have. He didn't have the, the full inspired word of God. All he had was what God had revealed to him up until that time. There's a couple little clues in here might show that, that this was post-Moses and that he did have some idea of the Mosaic law, the Mosaic standards. Job was not an Israelite. Don't, don't think in those, in those terms. You know, But that last thing he says, this is how he dismantles discouragement. You talk about being discouraged and having a reason to be discouraged. Yes? 
He says, the Lord gives the recognition of the sovereignty of God. The Lord takes away. He's in charge. I don't argue with him about it. Either way, blessed be the name of the Lord. What kind of a man with a relationship with God can do that? Or woman with a relationship with God can do that? Either way, blessed be the name of the Lord. It hurts. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It takes time sometimes. You've got to wait on God. There's loads of scripture in regards to that. Waiting on God. Oh, I'm going to read it to you. I'm a little off the reservation here, but I'm going to read it to you. In Lamentations, the third chapter, starting at verse 22. This is, this is Jeremiah's reaction now to Jerusalem being completely blown away, right? The Babylonians have come and gone, and he's sitting, as it were, in the midst of a smoldering pile of debris, a reference to the sins of the people of the southern kingdom. Lamentations 3.22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good. Listen, 25. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeks him. See, seeking refers back to waiting. Wait, seeking is waiting. Waiting is seeking. 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly, quietly wait for the deliverance of the Lord. That's Lamentations 3, 22 through 26. It's a good thing. Waiting quietly. That means not complaining. That means not, you know, whating. That means Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. He's in control. I love my Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Dismantling discouragement. Back to Job 13. Look at what Job has to say. He's got Zophar, one of the so-called three comforters, and they were none of that, uh, that were there with him. You had uh, Zophar, let's see, and you had Eliphaz and Bildad. Man, the names these parents hang on their kids. <laughs> Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And Zophar is arguing with him right now. And they're just figuring that Job is just, you know, he's just self-righteous. His responses to all this stuff, right? And they're trying to pull him out. Well, at the end of the text, uh, in chapter 42, God says to these three guys, You have not spoken truth concerning me like my servant Job has. So you're going to seek my servant Job out. You're going to bring a sacrificial, sacrificial system of animals, animal blood. You're going to ask him to intercede and pray for you so that you might be forgiven. Well, Zophar now, he's all over him at this point. And now Job is responding. He says to him, chapter 13, starting at verse 13, he says, hold your peace. Shut up. Let me alone that I may speak. I can't get a word in edgewise with you. And let come on me what will. In other words, he's, Zophar has been saying what the very things that you're talking about is going to bring the judgment of God on you. You need to repent, Job. And Job just says, you know what? I'm going to talk, and then whatever's going to come on me is going to come on me. Let it come on me. Because this is the man that said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I've lost everything. But I know my father, and there's a trust factor that's going on here. 14, wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? In other words, why am I taking my own life in my hand by saying and behaving the way that I am? Here it is, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain or I will argue my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite shall not come before him. But I want you to focus on verse 15. He's recognizing that these things that he's been going through, second time, the second meeting between God and Satan and the sons of God in Job chapter 2, has God giving Satan permission 
to go ahead and touch Job's body. And so we don't know what it was, something that resulted in great massive boils. And he sat in the ashes and he's scraping the boils to get the pus out to relieve himself from the pain. But you got to remember that as you read through Job, you can tell Job and his so-called three friends, they didn't have any understanding of any Satan. They didn't know about any kind of devil. That, that revelation hadn't been made. Uh, to them. And so they know there is one God, and they believe all things are coming from him. See, they don't, they don't realize that it's coming from this evil third party. So he says in 15, though he, that is God in his mind, slay me, that's what he means, yet will I trust him, which makes this even all the more powerful. Because he's so submissive to this one that he believes, he, he hands his life over to him in full trusting, even if it means that his life on this earth ends with this thing, right? Even though he believes that his life could end, he trusts and hands it over to God and says, I'll trust him. I'll trust him. I'll confide in him. Put my hope in him. But I will Speak, he says now to Zophar, I will speak and argue concerning his ways before him. In other words, I have some things to say. I don't believe my God, there's an underpinning here, I don't believe my God is going to slay me just because I have an opinion. and I have some things to say, which he has been doing. I don't want to sidetrack us and take us into that. But there's a result to all of this. What was this dismantling of Job's discouragement? And how can I and how can you use this? How can we use this? How can we turn this into a tool, you know, of dismantling discouragement in our lives and stick it in our toolbox of faith? Well, what is that tool? 15 is the tool that even though in the face of death, accompanied by great physical pain, mental anguish, his wife had already said to him she was no help whatsoever in the second chapter. She says, you know, why do you still continue to hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, that's, that's the help meat that you want. Curse God and die. And he says to her, you sound like one of the foolish women. Or do we to receive good from God's hand and not evil? So you see, that's just, you, you get his mindset that's going on right here. But though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, there it is right there. There's an element of trust that when everything else is going on, in the midst of the discouragement, in the midst of I haven't got enough, uh, in the midst of my wife is not supporting me or my husband is not supporting me, you know, um, the doctor's giving me nothing but bad news. In the midst of all of this, there's an element of trust, which is the root of faith that is part of our toolbox. But this is not a standalone. Now, I do want you to see the result now. If you'll go with me to chapter 42, I want you to quickly see the result of Job and his, though he slay me, yet I will trust him attitude. Chapter 42, looking at verse 10. Looking at verse 10 together. This is after uh, God says what he says to the three comforters about going to Job and getting his prayer and sacrificing the seven bullocks and such. 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. That's very instructive. When we pray, when we forgive, you know, you can't pray for somebody and be in a position of unforgiveness towards them. It don't work. It don't work. But God turned. I like the way that, see, this is why I'm using the King James right now. He turned the captivity of Job, turned it around, turned it around when Job prayed for these so-called friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And then it speaks about all of his brothers and his sisters coming before him and visiting with him, supporting him. Well, evidently they had not done that before. Apparently, they brought him money, um, probably because he was broke. So they're, they're providing now, taking care of one another. It's kind of a type of the church in Acts, the second chapter, verse 41, verse 42. And in that area right there, Acts 2, 41 and 42, where it says that 3,000 came into the church in one day, that's an approximate number, and they were all together listening to, listen, listen to me, listening to the apostles' doctrine in fellowship. They were eating together. They were in the word together. They were in prayer together. All that section right there speaks about that. And they 
You go on towards the end of the chapter and at the end of chapter 4 in particular. It's also in chapter 2. It talks about how the people you know, uh, uh, were living together and they did not count all of their things as totally their own. But rather they were selling different amounts of land and different pieces of property to meet other people's needs. The legitimate things is what we're talking about right here. So they're taking care of one another. I see a little bit of a type here in verse 11. So the Lord, verse 12, blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep. Started out with seven. And 6,000 camels started out with three, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 uh, female donkeys, and then it goes on uh, towards the end. This is the result of not letting this little thing of discouragement build up in you, build up more and more, but dealing with it as it comes to you. And not just letting it sit. How did Job dismantle this discouragement? 1315. Though he slay me, yet I'm going to what? Yet I'm going to what? Oh, no, no, no. You're not convincing me even slightly. Though he slay me, yet I'm going to trust, trust him. Trust him. The call that is given out is succinct and clear. That's this dismantling of discouragement with Job. Now let's consider dismantling discouragement with David. And now real close to the right, we're going to the 13th Psalm. The 13th Psalm, like I said to you earlier, now there are several places, especially in the early Psalms, where David speaks about conditions and the situation in his life, you see, uh, that he had plenty to be discouraged over. Some of it you can see his youth in. Some of these early Psalms, his youth, you can see it. He's complaining a little bit more, you know, kind of acting like somebody young and without, you know, some experience. So that's understandable right there. As he gets older and the Psalms begin to progress in regards to time and, and this kind of a thing, you see that, yeah, he's coming across things that have the potential for discouragement, but he's treating it in a little bit better way. He's getting to the dismantling aspect quicker is what he's doing, all right? Here in the 13th chapter, we start out with him asking God a question, and you can read the issue right into it. He says, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? <laughs> how long wilt thou hide thy face from me? All right, so he's jumping to a conclusion right here that God has forgotten all about him. Evidently, he's been praying to God and God's not responding in the time that David wants him to respond. Oh, yeah, none of us have ever felt that way, have we? Oh, I mean, my gosh, you know, when we want God to do something, we want it now, we want it now. But what did we just read in Lamentations 3, verse 21 through 26 right there? It is good for a man to wait on the Lord, waiting for his deliverance. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. It's something I've been learning more and more about uh, at home. Um, you know, we've talked to you guys about thanking God and praying uh, for us in regards to the... Uh, the side effects of, of some of the, uh, the work that's being done on me. And it hasn't been as bad as I've seen it with other people. But the more I put everything together, the word, my experience, and looking at other people who don't know the Lord, I'm like, well, this is why. This is why they're having a harder time than I am. They can't reach into the covenant promises of the book because they're not regenerate. They don't know him. They're relying on man. But the Bible says, curse is the man that relies on flesh. Asa, King Asa, trusted in the physicians. He was sick in his feet. What's the rest of it? So he died. So he died. This is the problem. And the solution and the dismantling to a discouragement like this is Christ. It's Christ. And for us, it's knowing the word, being in the word, being doctrinal people. So that when, not if, when, not if, something like this was to happen to you, you're ready. You're ready. Nobody wants to think about it. I certainly didn't want to think about it. Of course not. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? Apparently, I'm not getting God's attention as quick as I would like. Two, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? And I'm having to counsel myself in my own soul is the idea. I, I need you to counsel me, but instead I'm having to do it myself. He's a little accusative here, isn't he? Having sorrow in my heart daily. 
And see what this is doing to me? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? <laughs> he's implying, when he asks this question, he's implying it's going on too long. This needs to stop, right? I hear you. He says, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. This might kill me. Let my enemy say I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But, however... Verses 5 and 6, thank God that the Holy Spirit moved on David to be enlightened in this area because here comes how David dismantles the above discouragement. And this is what you and I need to learn from right here. He says, verse 5, but I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Noticed it or not, there are three bullet points there. There are three nails that firmly need to be hammered in to the moment of discouragement. That little beast running around at the base of your feet, nipping at your heels, nipping at your toes, causing you just enough problem to discourage you and bring you down. There are three bullets that we need to put into that little mongrel's head. The first bullet, verse 5, is trust. He says, number one, but I have trusted in thy mercy. And the Hebrew word here for trust has a lot to do with confiding, confiding. You know, when you, uh, when you get close to a friend and you just need to talk to somebody, and you uh, confide in your brother, your sister, uh, an important thing, maybe it's something you want to keep quiet. Isn't it a horrible thing? When you find out maybe a day, two, maybe an hour or two later that somebody else knows all about this thing that you confided in that person. And how do you feel? Betrayed. Betrayed. Yeah. And angry. And feeling that maybe you could call them up and cuss them a little and be valid. Right? A little revenge move kind of a thing. But David says, I have trusted, confided in what? In thy mercy. Here it is. God's not going to go back on this. God's not going to take away the mercy. Now, the mercy is what the focus is all about. Trusted in thy mercy. The focus is not on trust per se. It's on mercy. But the vehicle by which you are able to embrace God's mercy is trust. It's the confiding. And then he has a second point. He says, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I heard Elder Brian make a reference to that earlier today. You're teaching uh, something along those lines. And, of course, Paul talks about that in Philippians. It's in other places as well. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes. And again, I say rejoice. Right? That's how that goes. Rejoice in the Lord sometimes and only when I feel good. Rejoice, rejoice only when I feel like it. Rejoice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what we end up doing. It may not be what we sing, but that's what we end up doing. We're not consistent about it. I tell you what, I am having lots of practice of being consistent. Talk about, you know, thrown on the, uh, you know, the, the rack kind of a thing, and I got nowhere to go, you know. And it's, it's been an amazing adventure so far. An amazing adventure, you know. And I have nothing to complain about. Nothing whatsoever. I, I, God's... I don't, I don't even know if it's in me anymore. I mean, I feel great. You know what I'm saying? I'm dealing with, you know, the after effects of certain things, you know, side effects and all that business. And, you know, once again, you know, we're back to, to going, man, you know, this, the, while it's doing me good, there's aspects that are not doing me so good, right? But there's a balance point in all of this. He says, my heart shall rejoice in thy deliverance. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's not delivered yet. Is he? Because he just got through saying, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How much longer is it going to be? But he says, no, no, I'm going to rejoice in thy deliverance. That's what salvation means, is a deliverance. That means he's already got it. 
He's already choosing to have it. He's already choosing to experience it. I will rejoice in the Lord. Not sometimes, but always. Not in anything, you know, uh, 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 nebulous, but in something specific. In his deliverance. I say I am delivered. I say that. I say uh, to God, I say to others around me, I say to the doctors, I say to the nurses. You know, you got me, you're just going to have to put up with this stuff. The word goes out and that's the way it is. You get me on your gurney or something like that. And I'm going to talk to you about Psalm 118 and verse 17. Right? I'm going to talk to you about these passages. I'm going to talk to you about Psalm 41. And verse 3, the Lord will strengthen me upon my bed of sickness and he will heal me throughout all of this. I just misquoted that. You go look it up. <laughs> Psalm 41, verse 3. But Psalm 118, I quote that a lot. Verse 17, you know, <clears throat> that I will continue to declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has not given me over unto death. The Lord has not given me over unto death. I will live and not die and declare the glorious works of the Lord. And other things I could talk to you about. So I rejoice in that deliverance. And then there's a third bullet that we're going to pop in the head of that squealing little monster of discouragement. Verse 6, he says, I will, I will, I will. I will sing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He's got it already. He's got the past tense rolling. He has dealt bountifully with me. So he says, I will sing. Now in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the, the writers use the Greek word basalo, basalo, and it's the Greek word for a psalm. Sometimes it can be translated song, and that's perfectly fine, but it's the proper noun for psalm. So he says, I will psalm unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. That's why we sing psalms here. So at my house, you know, every chance we get, we come around the corner and there's a psalm hitting you. We're, we're playing more uh, um, uh, metrical psalms, psalms put to music in our, in our house more and more. This is, this is great. This is wonderful. Uh, and it's going to have, you're going to benefit from all of this too, you see. The, the scripture is like, it's like when you sing to God, when you sing to God, look at Psalm 95 with me. God wants to hear what he says worships him. He wants to hear his word back to him. He's given us 150 different songs or psalms. He's given us 150 different of these things. And he wants us to utilize them. Now, that doesn't mean we don't sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, as long as it is biblically and accurately, doctrinally sound. There are some things, you know, we'll never sing in this place. And you know that I stop you from singing certain lines and certain, certain uh, hymns because they're just plain wrong, you know. Man alive. What's that Martin Luther thing? What's that thing? Mighty Fortress is our God. Half of it is about the devil. Check it out sometime. We won't sing it. I don't sing it. I don't sing about him. Except for the fact that he's in the lake, 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 he's in the lake. In Psalm 95 and verse 2, check it out. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. In the Hebrew and the Greek, salo, psalms. You hear it in Ephesians 5, verse 19. Come together with psalms, hymns, spiritual song, singing to one another, building one another up. So you, if you're not together, if we're not together, we can't sing to one another. We can't build one another up. So we have to be together. Hello? Use the psalms, Colossians 3, 16. Singing, psalming to one another. In Acts 16, verse 19, you know the story. Paul and Silas are in Philippi. They're locked up in the jail. They're way down in the deep, 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 deep dungeon. And they're all locked up. They're in the stocks. What are they doing? They're psalming to God. They're singing psalms to God. What did Jesus and the boys do at the end of the uh, uh, Passover meal? They sang Psalm 118. I mean, it's just, it perforates through all of this. And so we see it, of course, in the church that that continues on.
You have to sing the Psalms with knowledge. You have to understand where law ends and grace begins uh, in, uh, in the Psalms. It's under law. But there's so much beauty there. If you have an understanding, you get the entire theolog theological structure of the soteriological plan of God in the Psalms, including, of course, our Messiah is there uh, in the Psalms. Oh, my gosh. So what are the three ways we dismantle discouragement according to David? Number one, I trust in his mercy, verse 5. Two, I rejoice in that deliverance. It hasn't, it hasn't manifested yet, but it will. And I'm going to act like it already has. And three, I psalm unto the Lord. Why? Because he has dealt bountifully with me. So our toolbox, wait, let's give it a shake our toolbox is starting to fill up a little bit, isn't it? We got Job. We got David right here starting to fill up. And this is not the only stuff. And I'm going to leave you with just one more before we end this today. I'm going to outfit your toolbox so that when you leave this place today, you will be reasonably equipped out of the Word of God so that when that time of discouragement comes, when it hits, whether it's physical discouragement, mental, emotional, what, whatever it might be, You'll have tools practically. You can take your outline. You can go through this. You take you right to the text. And you can say, this is it right here. I'm singing unto the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I can be like Job. I can yell louder than that. I can be like Job. And I can say, man, the Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But now let's go to Paul and let's consider 2 Corinthians and the 10th chapter. 2 Corinthians and the 10th chapter. Most everybody is familiar with this. 2 Corinthians 10th chapter. Paul, of course, is dealing with a bunch of corrupt Corinthians that just, you know, they're taking what these false prophets and false apostles are saying to them and uh, turning it on its head and turning on Paul, you know, and Oh, my gosh, it's terrible. But Paul says that these people, you know, they want to accuse me of walking in the flesh. And even though we walk physically, bodily in the flesh, we certainly do not war after the things of the flesh. We'll start back at verse 1 to give us a little context. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. That's sarcasm, because they were saying that earlier to him, okay, or about him. Verse 2, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Walk is another way of saying live or act or behave or something like that. Walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, verse 3 says, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What a recipe for dismantling discouragement that he gives us right here in particular. All right, There's a lot more here than there is in what we have seen elsewhere, so I've got to move along rather quickly here. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh physically, we live in our bodies. Yes, you know, we, the physical, we have physical responses to things, you know. Yes, our feelings get hurt, right? even though we're walking in the flesh, in bodies, as physical human beings. But you know what? We don't, he says, war after the flesh. We don't stratuomitha. Yeah, there's a word you'll take home. Stratuomitha. And the root there, stratuo, is from which we get the English words. you hear it? Strategy. Strategy, exactly. St to strategize is a word that they use for making war, making plans for war, making, you know, getting ready to go after the enemy and finding the weak spot and all that kind of a thing, making a plan. He says, we do not strategize after the flesh. In other words, I'm not going to respond to this thing 
this financial thing, this physical thing, this spiritual thing. Maybe I got kids that are just like, they're freaking me out, you know? It's like I can't get them to come under of submission whatsoever. I've gone in this direction. I've tried this, oh, tough love, you know, and all that kind of a thing. But the fact is, you know, is that as soon as I go to some secular appointment, to keep some secular appointment in regards to using one of these secular tools, then I'm, I'm, I'm warring according to the flesh. Am I going to get a godly, successful result? No, I'm not going to get a godly, successful result when I do that because I'm turning to man, see? And so he says, we do not stratuomithas st after the flesh. Well, why is that? Well, for. For the weapons, explanatory. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. Now, weapons here, that's uh, 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 in verse 4, that's uh, toapla, to toapla. Um, this is a plural. Uh, so, yes, weapons is right, but these are specific hand weapons. These are close encounter weapons. These are knives. Uh, these are shorter kind of uh, punching blades and, you know, uh, things where you might wallop somebody like a hammer close up. Um, it's, in other words, it speaks towards close up. You are in contact one on one. This is not, you know, at a distance kind of fighting. That when you fight in this way, when there is an imagination, he's going to call it. When there is going to be that which brings discouragement. And I'll tell you what, all discouragement begins where? Right up here. We start letting it take over. We start letting it have its way with our mind, with our thinking. Too much TV that feeds, that feeds, that feeds. The, the world has nothing encouraging to give you. The world will not encourage you. The world will not give you God's answer to bring you out of discouragement so that you are walking in the light as he is in the light. So that you are able to walk in the gifts and the office and the power of the presence of the perfect Christ here on the earth right now. The earth doesn't believe that. The world doesn't believe that. They're not going to give you anything that will encourage you in that direction. These opla, these close encounter weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but mighty through God. That means that what makes them powerful, what makes them useful, is God charges them himself, making them useful, making them successful. It's like a little bit earlier today, before the, uh, uh, the, the service started, I asked Tony, um, batteries, I always do that when I'm gone. How old are the batteries, you know, in the in our microphone device? And Tony thought, well, it's a couple weeks. And I thought, do you think that's that's six that's six recordings then? We, we better change them, you know. Um, we try to stay on top of that because, you know, what happens? We, we got a pretty good little system right here, but even the best kind of system, if you don't have any power going, if you don't have any juice, it don't matter. So these things, he says here, these weapons, and he's going to talk about these weapons in just the next verse right here, are only mighty and powerful and effectual through who? 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 I'm frustrating you, aren't I? They're only mighty and effectual through... God. See, Father, he's got to empower. He's got to pop it, right? So... So, wherefore, they are not carnal, but mighty through God, resulting in what? To the pulling down of strongholds. It's the, uh, now, a stronghold here, this is fun. A stronghold here is like a citadel. It's a citadel. It's, a, it's, it's made out of stone, usually. And uh, many of the Romans, uh, when, they would, uh, when they would go in and attack opposing uh, enemies, they would have citadels and whatnot. Down in these citadels, there would be a dungeon. There would be dungeons, okay? And, of course, uh, captives kept down in the dungeons. And Paul is bringing this entire idea right here into this, this section about pulling down these imaginations, these discouragements, all right? So what Paul, no doubt, probably had seen or heard of was these citadels being pulled down, one brick, one rock at a time, exposing the inner underbelly of the workings of the enemy, right? So they're not hid anymore, right? And so once that takes place, then the Romans are able to charge in and go down and release the captives or to take captives of the Romans' enemies right here. 
So it's mighty through God, he says, the weapons of our warfare, you know, in order to beat discouragement, mighty through God, he's the one who empowers it, with the result of, or for the purpose of, pulling down dungeons. A lot of times, uh, some, some commentators uh, will say, and I agree with them about this, that these dungeons involve speculations, because the entire purpose right here is what's going on in our heads, what we're speculating about, what gets us down, you see, one little thought after the next, after the next, that pulls us down. We never do anything about these little thoughts, but God says do something about it now. Do something about it right then. Otherwise, it piles up on you. It builds up. Which is tougher to, to pull down? A two-brick wall, two wall or a 200-brick wall? See? Five. Continuing this idea of pulling down these dungeons, these speculations. Five says that in this, this is an opla, this is a hand weapon, casting down, right? Casting down what? imagination, speculations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now these imaginations, speculations, they have no reality in them. They have no truth in them. Oftentimes we get down over things that have not happened yet. We get down over things that have not happened yet, but we allow them to have power over us. See. And the frank fact of the matter is, is that they probably won't ever happen to us. But he says, cast them down now. Don't let them get with their claws and get into the spirit of your mind and get hooked up in there. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing. Now when he says high thing, it seems to be pointing back to that idea of the citadels again. That the Romans were tearing down and exposing the inner parts so that they could go down into the dungeons below. And lead those people out, those captives. And to arrest and put in chains the enemy. And I got something to show you right here. This is fun. Every high thing, that's the citadels, that exalts or raises itself is the meaning. Raises itself against the knowledge of God. Wow, see how, how full this is right here? What, 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 what is raising itself against the knowledge of God in our culture? Sure, sure. Let's get some specifics going here. Let's talk about some of the laws that are recently you know, engaged in our culture. These are things that are raised up against the knowledge of God. What do you think? Our president just... Uh, over the, I guess it was over the weekend or something last week. I don't know. He just, uh, he just went to, uh, to involve himself with three different um, support situations. Rome is burning and he's out playing fiddle man. In any case, one of them had to do with the lesbians, the gay and lesbians, you know, kind of a thing and giving them support. He just got through signing something. I forget what it was off, offhand, but it had to do uh, with allowing them some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, social support. Uh, this is a, a, a something that has been raised and exalting itself against the knowledge of God. Against the knowledge of God. What do we do? What do we do? Well, we pray. Of course we do. Of course we pray. Of course, God is working through our prayers. We also are active in regards to ministering the word, <coughs> ministering the gospel. No need to attack every need to speak the word clearly. Not in a technical way, but in a simple way. In a simple way. He says that this high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He says, and there's more, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now you see that word captivity right there? The root there for that word has to do with the word that is translated into English as a spear. Spear. S-P-E-A-R. A spear. It's the business end of the pole, right? <laughs> okay? This spear. Now, watch this. We are bringing into captivity every thought. Now, here's the picture. The citadel has been breached. The citadel of vain imaginations and that which builds up discouragement in our lives has been breached. What are we to do about it? We're to take those individual things that are either true or not true up against the word of God and we use the scriptures themselves to bring them into a captivity it becomes the spear that we use and we've got them chained those things and we have that pointy end of the spear to their back 
and were marching them out of the citadel and out of the area that they were trying to control, like the Romans would be moving them out of that, that area. So they're no longer there. They're no longer a factor anymore. They no longer control. They no longer bring their discouragement. We have effectively and effectually dismantled that area of discouragement. But you have to do these things. Memorize this text. Memorize the sex, casting down imagination, speculations, casting it down, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought. There it is. There it is. Bring into captivity every thought. What? Just sort of chain it up and stick it in the corner over there and say, shut up, man. I'm trying to watch TV. <laughs> no. 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 We bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. We take that thing that we've been thinking about and we replace it with obedience to Christ. Do you know there's so many passages about, especially in John's gospel and in 1 John, about the primacy of obedience if you're a believer in Christ, if you're born again. There's a primacy of obedience. It's a fruit that results itself letting us all know that we are in Christ. That's one thing that lets us know we're in Christ. You know, when somebody is born again, ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully to this and I'm done. Maybe, maybe not. When somebody is born again, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. That God reaches down and removes the Adamic sin nature, replaces it with the divine nature, and now we have Paul saying things like, you know, you're a new creation in Christ. I've been created anew. That's a miracle. Do you believe that you know, the creation of the physical heavens and earth was a miracle, was miraculous? See? Well, being born again is set up in the exact same way. See, this is why I have such great trouble with people who insist uh, to me that they are Christians, and yet they disobey the word, you know, nine times out of ten, or five times out of ten. And it's amazing to me. You can take them to 1 John 3, verse 6, verse 9, and other passages like that that make mandatory, that make mandatory belief in Christ and walking in obedience and not continuing to sin. Not continuing to sin. Not continuing to sin. See, that's God's plan, is to stop the sin factor in our lives and bring that thing under control. Chain it all up and bring it unto the obedience of Christ. Make it yield to the Word of God. And they don't do it. Or they do it sometimes, and then it's over with. How much is okay to sin and still be considered a Christian? We should probably vote on that. Let's uh, convene a meeting, and we'll make a decision. How much? Once a year, and you're still a Christian. Once a month, for those of us who are liberal, and you're still a Christian. You know, once a week, I, I mean, I don't know. How much do you need and still feel like you're okay and still feel mentally, you know, in good shape? I, I, I mean, look, and this is why it's important to <laughs> stay in balance. The word's in balance. First John, the, the second chapter. In the first verse, you know this, brother and I, children, I write these things unto you so you don't sin. What's the next line? Yeah, but if you do, we have an advocate with the Father. You go to Jesus, confess your sins. He's our advocate. He's our go-between. But if you do, so it's understood that nobody's perfect and nobody is without sin. Because Romans 7 says the law of sin is within each of us, even though the Adamic sin nature has been removed. But this law of sin is something else. And it's in there. And God uses it like spiritual muscle building of resistance in our lives to bring us into the image of Christ. And so we come to the conclusion of what it means to fill our toolbox with these tools that will dismantle discouragement. You don't try to dismantle discouragement all at once. You take it a piece at a time, a brick at a time, a barbed wire at a time. It takes time to learn how. Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 12, he had learned these things. Watch 4, 11 through 12 of Philippians. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know 
how both to be abased, I know, how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer. So how do I start? How do I start the plan? How do I get this ball rolling and start dismantling these discouraging things in my life? How about starting with Job? Job 13. Oh, I don't know. We could start then with, uh, oh, how about David? Oh, David, Psalm 13. And let's not forget the apostle who wrote the New American Standard Version. <laughs> you guys are a little slow sometimes. <laughs> I think it's funny. It's like five seconds go by, then laughter happens. It's okay. As long as the laughter happens, all right? We can go to 2 Corinthians 10. We can do 3 through 5. In fact, that is really the linchpin of so much victory right there. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. But I tell you this right now as we close this down today. I tell you this right now. It is not God's will for you to be walking around in a state of discouragement. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, because it's so important. Because it's worth saying again. To joy in the Lord and then to rejoy. Re, to repeat, to rejoice, to do it again. Always. I mean, it's like, okay, Paul, I got it. Rejoice pretty much covers it. No, do it always. Rejoice always. That's why we sing psalms. Get used to it. You know, one of the best ways of learning scripture is put it to music. That's how God made us. He made us this way uh, to be able to uh, latch hold of uh, the words of, of a tune when it's set to, to some kind of a tune. You know, I don't know why we're that way, but it works. And that's why we're inserting more and more psalms. You know, C Carrie and I, she's been doing a lot of work herself. But what uh, we've, uh, maybe next week we'll, we'll do this. We're going to have a little moment uh, where all of us will insert a psalm sheet ourselves. You'll take your, your Psalter, and she's going to stand up here. Well, she won't stand behind this because that would be sin. But she'll, she'll stand over here. And she'll say, now here, you know, you take this and just stick it. Everybody go one, two, three, and down it goes, you know, kind of a thing. Well, yeah, you'll be the suit. You're going to dress up like that? With a little mic right there? A little light goes off over to your head? A little, little deal comes down, you know, and put it on your... Okay, never mind. Yeah, um, the Psalms, putting these things to music. And then you have it with you all the time, dismantling discouragement. And then you won't be like David when David says, How much longer, oh God? You know, Psalm 13. That's a young man. That's a young, inexperienced Christian's response. How much longer, oh God, oh God? And we'll make sure the discouragement does not have its weight and way in our lives ever again. Part of the growing process. Father, thank you for, for this word that you have given, Lord, to your servant, so that I might pass it on to your servants. Oh God, let these here, my precious brothers and sisters, Lord, just so benefit um, from these, these three bullet points here that we pull out of your precious inspired word. And may, oh wonderful Father, uh, these things be spoken of by them to one another. Um, may they say, yeah, you know, he was saying this and I can use that here in my life. And Lord, let these things not fall on deaf ears. Let them not fall to the ground. And may we truly be those who trust in the Lord, who sing unto the Lord who love him and obey him and give him the glory at all times. Thank you for strengthening me, Lord, and helping me to stand back here today. Um, we bless your name today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.